And um, so I was telling her, I know that we only meet, you know, the first Friday in the month or whatever, but Friday is when I do most of my grading and trying to take two classes and um, at Anderson and yeah, um, this will be sort of our transitional meeting yeah. where we'll actually um, introduce. So, so if you rolled off, this would be like the last meeting you would be required to attend as a senator. We hope, you know, we hope you continue to attend as a faculty member and we I uh, obviously appreciate your input. Okay. Today, I'll remember that today would be my requirement. Today's my birthday. Well, happy birthday. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, um, yeah, well, we're just going bowling tonight, everybody. <laughs> I was like, what are you going to do? I was like, okay, it's not a milestone or anything. So, uh, you know, all my kids come into town and we just get together and um, that's the best birthday present ever, just having all of them get together. Well, it's my eighth wedding anniversary and I'm going to take my lovely wife out to a nice dinner and uh, we're actually going to go to uh, see a jazz group. So, It's your what wedding anniversary? Eighth. Number eight. Oh, oh, today on my birthday? Uh, actually, it was on Tuesday, but we but we couldn't celebrate it that day. Oh, uh, okay. Because I have a cousin, um, and every year, I, I, it's like I'm seeing this for the first time, and I was like, I knew this right, because he's always, I'm always seeing his wife on Facebook say happy, and I was like, we don't have the same birthday, and then I keep remembering, <laughs> oh, they got married on my birthday, so... Um, yeah it's so funny. It's our family has our family has a busy may my dad's birthday is may 5th my wife and i's anniversary is may 7th my brother's anniversary he just had his 25th on may 8th and then we always have mother's day and my parents anniversary where they're gonna they're gonna be celebrating 62 is may 11th so the beginning of May is a lot of celebration in Bell family. <laughs> wow. Well, for us, it's November. For us, it's November and August. Um, all three of Michael's, well, me, Michael, his brother, and his sister, we all got married in August. All of her kids were born in August. Um, uh, my sister-in-law's birthday is in August. And then November is like, all of my grand nieces and nephews it seems like every one of them were born in um november and two of my children are in november so no it's november and august for us but um for me anybody on anybody on november 11 11 11 uh 11 11 who is that number sounds familiar that's, oh, that's yeah, my birthday. Every teases me and says that's the angel. That's the angel birthday or the angel number one 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 to the four ones. So. <laughs> hey Matthew, isn't Jalen's birthday November eleventh? Yeah. Yeah, we have a November eleventh, and Matthew is November fourteenth, and um, so uh, it's just November and um, like I said, November and August. But. Go ahead. Busy months, busy, 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 busy. Hey everybody, um, I, I'm guessing the Zoom's working okay. I I'm, I tried to do the recurring meeting thing uh, per John's request, but it ended up in the process creating like three different invites, which is why I don't don't personally <laughs> love doing the recurring meeting style. Um, but it, hopefully everybody got the same link and we're all going to go to the same place. We don't have the issue we had back last summer. It seems like it's going pretty good so far, but. Um, if anybody gets any panicky texts or emails, um, let me know and I'll make sure they get the link. And then I also had taken the, I guess I got confused. I had taken off the um, rolling off senators off of the, off the attendance sign in. Um, we can just ask them to add their name under guest, I guess today. Uh, sorry, but I added the new folks on there. Um, yeah, clearly we're in kind of a, kind of a flux right now and <laughs> pretty Pretty stoked to be able to pass this secretary torch along to someone who may want it. Yes. Um, and maybe, so just get to, maybe just get to participate in the in the meetings moving forward without 
uh, all dealing with the logistics. That that would be a nice experience, but today yeah, I, I don't will do my best. I don't envy you having to try to take it uh, take it down, <laughs> take it all down, and take it all forward. down. Run the chat, run the Zoom, get the attendance sheet to people repeatedly <laughs> throughout the meeting. It's uh, yeah, it's a lot. It takes a lot of bandwidth, but uh, this. <laughs> Not that, this not will... that I, I'm trying to discourage anyone else from taking. <laughs> <laughs> well, this will be my last meeting presiding as president. I, my two years have run. I think I might run for another position, um, but, uh, but that's this will be my last meeting as president, at least for a while. Well, you are uh -huh. a great president. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah, it's gonna be. This will, I think, be my last meeting as secretary too. We'll we'll see how that goes. And then Mimi is at large, so what, <laughs> no, she's here, but she's in New York City on vacation. So we owe her an extra thanks for <laughs> taking time I'm out here. of that. Being, her, I know. Thank you. Let's see, Mimi. Well, let's see. You brought it down to this dinner, and now you can start to see. Kind of looks like Halloween in there. It does. It sounds like the head is getting its cape on. It looks like the little ghost. It has been. It's not me. That was Reggie. I'm, I'm muted. Oh. It's like, where is it Halloween? Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and Liz, whatever we... Amy gets on, we'll make her a co host so she can share. Oh, yeah. And I got to make Mimi a co -host. Oh, you know what? The other thing, you know what she asked? Because she said, actually, she sent me an email um, yesterday saying that she's going to be in our car. Oh, wow. Um, oh, no, really? <laughs> well, not oh, driving. Boy. Not driving. But I think it may be a situation like where you've got, the, you know, he, she may be dropping somebody off or whatever. But um, actually, she asked. You know what? We don't need her to share. We need to share her presentation. Um, okay, so you have it. Yes. All right. Let me. Uh, I think. Well, I made you a co-host, so you have screen sharing. Okay. Yeah, if you could, um, you know, be the be the slide clicker yeah. when she needs it, that would be a big help to me. So I'm not trying to write down what no she's saying problem. and do that. Teamwork. Any other department heads here uh, sick to death of these third attempt requests that we have to, I had no idea how many of those I was going to have to process on a given day. Good gracious. A third attempt on a class? Uh-huh. We have to override them oh. for them to be able to have a third or fourth or eighth attempt. Um, even though, I mean, we don't turn them down. We just have to do that for them. So it's a whole... And of course, they reach out to you and they don't give you any of the information you need to do that. Student ID number, which semester, which section, any of that. <laughs> oh, looks like Amy's here. Yeah, Liz, typically what I do is if they don't give me that information, I tell them to go into self-service and put mm -hmm. the section they want into self-service. And that way, I at least have an idea of what I'm proving. <laughs> That's that's good advice. I actually set up an away message in my Gmail because I'm not teaching, so I'm not checking that as regularly. That basically says, I'm not checking this 
but more than once a week, email me at my Outlook one that I'm checking all the time. And if you're contacting me about a course override for a third attempt, mm -hmm. I need three pieces of information from you in that email. And that's actually helped a little bit. So that's good. That that even shows that they're reading your response. I mean, <laughs> but when they take forever to get back to me with those details and then they're like, have you done it yet? I'm like, well, no, you didn't tell me until two seconds ago. And Classes are about to start. I'm like, yes, I know. <laughs> well, well, well. Yeah, if, it is, if it isn't the consequences of your own actions. Yeah. yeah. I typically, when I respond to say that I'll put them in, I'll say, you should be able to see it on your schedule and then give them like a 30 minute delay of the time or, you know, by noon of today or something like that. So that way, yeah. if I'm in the middle of something else and I get, you know, sidetracked, I, I, at least they know it's not an immediate plug mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm having trouble getting colleague access off campus, even with the VPN. So oh, gosh. I, just yeah, had two, I just had two this morning and I'm like, well, I, you're going to have to wait until until Monday because I, I can't get into the system to do it. Yeah. So have you tried to register them through self-service? Oh, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can do that if I have the override privileges in there. You, I would try it. I'll try it. But, but my my privileges and access stuff has been so incons inconsistently applied over the last month that yeah keep running it's worth and, uh, a try if you're working from yeah. home you can yeah at least i would at least try okay first, i'll try to see and then okay. if you don't see anything send us a ticket okay sounds good just be sure you do the register on the course and not the register now if they have other classes planned because if they have other classes planned it will register them for all of the classes even if they're waitlisted ah uh, okay yeah we don't yeah. Want that. so make sure you just do that one class okay thank you that's very helpful mm -hmm. glad i brought it up all right, I'm going to send the attendance sign in. I'm going to put it in the chat, same as always. It's for those of you who are new. Basically, I uh, I give you a link to a Google Doc that you can edit where you just put an X by your name. I um I, ex <laughs> I already took the folks who are rolling off off the attendance because I got confused. So if you are here and you did, don't see your name, just put your name in the guest area, or if you are a guest, put your name in the guest area. And uh, yeah, hopefully. Everybody, All right, everybody well, what they need to do. All right, just send it. I will go ahead and gavel us to order for our May meeting. Thanks everybody for uh, being here. Um, I was mentioning it before when we were talking this, this will be my uh, last meeting as president. So uh, I, I certainly have appreciated the last couple of years, but my two year term limit is, is up. Um, so, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that, but this is very much a transitional meeting where we'll have both um, the folks who are rolling off as well as the people that are coming on to Senate. And uh, later on uh, in the meeting, we'll introduce our new senators and kind of discuss uh, uh, that we have one more step to take, which is the uh, election of new officers for 2024-2025. So we'll, talk, we'll discuss that. Um, as we move through. Um, but I wanted to start off, I, our, our guest speaker tonight, or today, this morning, uh, is a a Amy Munoz from Financial Aid. And I don't know if Amy, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me just fine? Yeah. And do, do you want me to share your um, your the presentation? Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. I have the slides here too that I'll walk through on my end just to okay. allow for consistency. So I've got it up, if everybody can see that. And then I'll just let, uh, if you, I'll, I'll put it up in presentation mode. And then if you tell me uh, when you would like me to move slides, I will go ahead and do that. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna go over, um, John had reached out to me and just kind of asked, you know, what are some things that would be helpful for uh, an advisor to know as you're working, I guess, advising the components of as you're working with the students, what would be, you know, beneficial or kind of some quick takeaways as far as financial aid goes. Um, so I just kind of put some things together that um, not getting too deep into anything, but just kind of some high level um, concepts of aid that, and probably the most common questions that you get and things that would be helpful for everyone as far as being able to help the student. So 
I'm going to start with the basically on our website, um, kind of uh, OCD about making sure that everything is updated on the website as much as possible. Um, thanks, John. So these are the financial aid steps. Um, this has been on the website for quite some time, but basically it just kind of shows, you know, from beginning to end what the student can expect as far as the aid goes. A lot of times the students will think that, you know, they just submit the FAFSA and they're done. Um, and this kind of gives a whole, you know, picture as far as what it looks like from the time that they do the FAFSA. Um, step two shows, you know, the, the communications that they'll get from us, um, the students submitting their documents, and, you know, they can see everything on self-service. So it kind of goes through the entire process here. Um, and each of these accordions has a drop down that shows um, more detailed information about each step, um, where they can find it in their self-service. So just kind of bringing that to you guys' attention that um, each step is, you know, really has some pretty detailed information that will help walk the student through, you know, hey, what's next, basically. Um, so we can go to the next slide. The, I guess, kind of like the takeaways from today would be um, that students, you know, don't have to be full time. Um, I think it's, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, get, let, me, uh, let me get that back. Sorry about that. I lost it there for a There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I would say like the one of the biggest misconceptions of all the years that I've been here, you know, with financial aid is that um, students feel like they have to be full time, even advisors or really anyone outside of financial aid. There's this misconception that students must be full time mm -hmm. um, unless they're receiving the life scholarship. Um, that's that's the only form of aid that requires full time. Um, six hours for most students is the magic number. Um, so that's just kind of something that would be helpful, you know, to keep in mind when you're seeing students or working with them. Um, we are pretty um, consistent and very, very focused on emailing the student. We, uh, as we all know, they don't read their emails, but we email them to let them know, um, you know, hey, we got your FAFSA. Okay, hey, this is needed. Okay, hey, we got this, but this is needed. So, I mean, there's always going to be an email from them. We have an email tracking screen from down to the second to when we send them emails out. So the students will come back and say, no one ever told me. And we'll go and look at that email screen and we'll say, well, we've, we've sent you six emails about, you know, needing your tax documents. Um, but so we basically all points and actions um, in that student, you know, financially life cycle, they're communicated with as well as, you know, being able to see, pretty much everything on their self-service. I heard you guys talking briefly about self-service before I started. And um, I'm not sure what your capabilities are or, or your privileges. Obviously, if there's any issue with privileges that can be quickly fixed by um, Tony in OIT with a ticket. But um, there are a couple screens that are super helpful. Um, one of them is SFAV, and I can come back to this later, but or FSCV, there's two students or two screens specifically, if you do have colleague access that you can essentially kind of, uh, I'm not gonna say remote in, but it gives you the view of exactly what the student's checklist looks like. Um, because basically every single student, over 90% of our students receive some form of financial aid. It's just a good thing to have during that part of the conversation to say, hey, have you done your FAFSA? Are you in good status? Here's where you go to see it. Even, even just that, it's a, a kind of a good takeaway. Um, we correspond with most of our students. Our traffic in person has dropped significantly in the last three, four years, really since COVID. And it never fully spiked again because the students just got used to our electronic um you know, digital uploads that they can do. A student really, unless they're doing an appeal, they don't have to come in to see us for anything. We respond to our email within 24 hours. Um, and then the other takeaway would be that financial aid awards incrementally. And I'm gonna show, I have a screenshot of that. It's actually on our website too. But the aid awards incrementally as the classes begin. We don't just do one fell swoop of a disbursement and that's it. Um, we award as the classes begin. Um, you can go to the next slide. This just is kind of a, high level picture of the most common, I guess you could say, types of financial aid um, that we apply here, um, as well as hundreds of different scholarships that students apply for. We also, those go through our office, but um, here's the top, 
you know, a couple federal awards and then the huge bulk of aid that we also apply is state awards and that lists them there. Federal work study where students work um, for a portion, essentially they're working, it's a $14 an hour job um, on or off campus. We have a really low response rate to work study. At this point, I'm sending emails out to students, hey, you're pre-qualified, just fill this application out and you have a job. Um, they're, it's, we have a hard time spending our work study dollars. Um, and then of course loans, but those are the most common types of financial aid there. Um, the next slide goes over just how all aid is kind of categorically broken down, you know, grants, work study, um, scholarships and loans. I'm, I'm sure, you know, most of you guys having gone through college yourself kind of have a general idea of grants um, and scholarships or types of aid that don't have to be paid back, um, whereas loans do. Um, and then the next slide, this is kind of what I was referring to with how aid disperses um, as the classes begin. So this is on the website. It lets the student um, see that here's kind of the schedule of when your aid is going to apply. So if you have a student, for example, who was in a you know flex online course that started February 5th in the spring, those courses due to um, inconsistent attendance taking, I guess you could say, we have to wait a really long time for the flex online courses um, to disperse aid because students are just forever coming in and out of those classes um, due to attendance kind of uh, ha having some issues on that side. So summer, um, you can see the disbursement schedule here. Um, and then, you know, the information at the bottom that just lets the student know that um, after we apply the aid, the business office kind of takes it from there and they have 14 calendar days to send out the refund. So again, this is taken directly from the website. Um, and then the next couple uh, slides just kind of go over just, you know, some little tidbits of common questions, repeat coursework, courses outside a major, um, and, and how aid pays. Um, it'll pay, federal aid will pay for a class um, one time beyond a pass grade. So a D is, you know, considered passing. So um, they get one more chance to take it. So if you're ever working with like a health science student, they're the repeat offenders of wanting to take classes over and over and over again for more points. Um, you know, aid can't consistently just keep paying and paying. There is a cutoff. Um, also, if a course is not required for their program, uh, the Office of Student Records sends out emails um, after they do their, um, we, they run a batch evaluation process and sends out emails saying, hey, this isn't required for your program. Um, and then, you know, aid can't calculate on that class if it's not required. That's a federal requirement. Um, you guys probably, if I had to guess, get emails from your advisees um, asking about that one. We can, I can take questions at the end if you need, but that's a pretty common uh, question that we also get. Um, and then the last one really is just kind of, I wanted to send a couple screenshots. The Career Pathways um, Scholarship has been, we've had it for probably seven, eight years can you advance one slide if you don't mind? Um, that's obviously on our website as well. Um, it's a very, very popular award that we have um, in the spring, or I'm sorry, next fall, 24, 25 year. This award will um, close the gap a lot more, getting us closer for in-state students and those eligible programs, um, closer to a zero tuition. It's not marketed that way because it's not zero tuition, but it, it is closing the gap um, a good bit for students in those programs. And um, then this screenshot here where I had referred to earlier in self-service where students can see um, the missing items that are needed. This is obviously an old screenshot, but the functionality looks the exact uh, same right now, but sorry, I just saw this George's screenshot pop up, but, um, yeah, so on their self-service, this is where they can see, Hey, this is the document that we need. And this is how you can get it. Here's how you submit it. So it kind of gives them all the steps from there. Um, but and the last slide just gives our email address. Basically, you know, this is how we have the vast majority of communication with our students. Um, 
they can obviously come if they want to, but as we've seen the past, you know, three to five years, it's been a very, very different change in how we deliver service. Um, and they're wanting a lot more um, email and even Zoom meetings. So, but yeah, here's our email address. Anyone can use it and multiple people are checking it throughout the day. It's probably the quickest way to get in touch with us. But does anyone have any questions? I know that was kind of a brief run through, but I didn't want to bore anyone with the wild world of financial aid. Anybody with questions? I have some, but I, I'm going to wait and let other people jump in first. Okay. Well, I've just got a couple. I, I don't know if these are questions or maybe they could form them as a question, Jeopardy style. Um, is there any way, I, I know this, I've noticed that um, in a lot of contexts, if you can send a text message to a, to uh, somebody, is there any way, have y'all thought about sending those reminders about things that they have to do through a text message? Yeah, we, we actually have um, for several different uh, uh, projects or, or campaigns, I guess you could say, um, to where we're seeing like a low response rate. We have, we've actually worked with Georgia's area to get those sent. Um, we've worked with marketing, you know, pretty regularly to get a few things sent out. Um, because it involves interfacing with another area and us not being able to like, quote, do it ourselves, it's probably, I would like to be able to do it more. Um, but then it just comes down to, um, A, who's who's agreed to um, allow for text messaging because the student has to consent. Um, but then also uh, just, I, I guess, really the philosophy of the college as far as how, when does, when do messages become irrelevant when you're constantly, you know, know what I mean? When you're sending texts all the time, I guess email could be the same question. So it just still yeah. isn't a platform that is readily available for us to access, to send out as often as we would like, I guess you could say, but we definitely, when we notice there's a low response rate with, with certain groups, Which, what, funny we, that... we get a very good response when we do send texts. Yes, Jill. There we go. Sorry. Hi, Amy. Um, quick question about the financial aid processing. I have um, kind of been reading about some delays that are happening at um, four-year schools around us, and I didn't, I wasn't sure if we were having any of the same concerns or issues with financial aid for our students for the fall semester. So, yeah, kind of what you're referring to, I mean, so super high level, but the FAFSA, um, after for the most part being the same for 30 to 50 years, they completely redid every possible element of the FAFSA, not only the data points and where they line up at the schools and you know that being a, a lift on our end, but also really for the student, it's a completely different application, completely different calculations that go into um, the aid eligibility requirements. So it's a completely different application. It was a horrible rollout um, by the U.S. Department of Education. Um, students pr prior were able to do the FAFSA in October um, of a year prior, and um, it was pushed back to January, um, so four or five months late. And then the records were not made available to the schools until the beginning of April. Um, so it has been a huge lag and it's especially difficult for the four-year colleges and other colleges that have the deadlines, which we, we don't have. So it, it, it has affected us, but, um, that's kind of what I had covered. I don't know if anyone saw the success check this past Monday. It was kind of to highlight that this is kind of going on nationwide, but we're still good. Um, we knew it was going to be coming. We worked with Georgia's area proactively over the past um, six to nine months and made sure that when the Department of Education was ready to release those 24, 25 FAFSAs to us, that we were ready to go. And we were. And um, we've been caught up for uh, over three weeks now. And we've emailed all the students um, that we got their FAFSA and they can submit the documents to us. So we're in a good place. And we, um, as it says on the website, we'll be having our offer letters out in the next couple of weeks here. So uh, I don't really have any concern on our end. I feel that we're, we planned ahead and we're doing good. Great. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. I was really interested in how we were doing and sounds like we're doing great. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's going great, but it's been very tough for the four years because they have those 
those deadlines that they've been used to operating within. And so I don't, a lot of commitment letters have, yeah, it's, it's a different world on that side. Yeah. So we've got a question in the chat. Uh, do you recommend uh, anyone in particular uh, for advisors, faculty, you know, somebody who's got a student uh, in their office in real time and they need financial assistance, financial, financial aid assistance, you know, who so would be we, the contact? Yeah. So we have actually a Teams thread with all of the DAC advisors that I would be more than happy to add. I mean, and it's real time. So, I mean, it might be a one or two minute lag if someone is with a student or researching the account, but we have a Teams um, chat. I could add anyone to it. Okay. It, it's real time. Um, a lot of times, you know, phone might be a little bit difficult if someone's in the middle of running multiple processes and doesn't have a session that they can work with, or if three people are, you know, down in a conversation room seeing a student. Um, John, if you want to gather names at the end, and if anyone would like to be added to that text or the chat thread, it's on Teams. It would, I, it'd be awesome. Yeah. If anybody's interested, if you just put your name uh, in a, in the chat box, we'll we'll kind of make a, a record of that. And I think the other question is is the uh, financial aid determination different in the summer because of a of the shorter semester? Um. So students can still still receive any type of except for the life scholarship. I mean, they'd have to be in twelve hours, which isn't very common course load to take in the summer. But all aid types can be dispersed uh, in the summer, you know, the students, for the most part, you know, I'm not, this isn't a broad sweeping statement, but for the most part, six hours, it's going to be um, needed to release the vast majority of the types of financial aid, but we can still disperse aid in the summer just as we would throughout the year um, because it is shorter and students might just take one or two classes. That would be the only difference of like, if a student's taking one, you know, they might not have any aid because it's just three hours. Um, but it's the same credit hour requirements for aid in the summer, you know, six is half time and 12 is full. Is, is that, I'm not sure if that's the answer they were looking for, but. Okay. And I made a note of something that, that regularly becomes, and, and you had mentioned the SAP of the appeals. Is there any way that, we, and George might be able to weigh in on this, whether we could get an automated form for that? Yes, I have. This is the bane of my existence with SAP appeals. Um, <laughs> I probably, I, I can say for certain, I want it more than you do because it is the one biggest barrier to the appeal. Um, and also, understandably so, faculty and staff answering or asking questions about how, how do I, what, do you, what is this, you know? Um, unfortunately, it's kind of beyond the area of financial aid. It involves um, the eval screen <laughs> being properly calculated um, because if it was, it would just tell us how many hours that student has left in their various programs. And we could pull that into our rubric that is already automated. Um, but the theos behind the appeal is that they have the conversation with their advisor to kind of say, here's where you're at. Here's how many hours you have left in your program. Um, is this realistic for you? Um, but the SAP appeal and the work study is are two of the most manual. Um, and I'll, I'll say because they involve multiple parties, you know, it's the student, it's us, it's um, academic coaching, it's their advisor. Something needs to be done to improve that. I reach out every semester when the form is tweaked and say, hey, I'll, I'll reach out to a few of my friends that are advising um, to look for feedback on how can this be done easier and quicker. Let me, I mean, if you guys can send me ideas you have because yes, it's very manual and we have worked to avoid having to do any sort of manual process in our office, but because it involves so many different people and having that conversation, I just haven't found the perfect fix. Nathan? Yeah, see Nathan. Yeah, Amy, I'm going to follow up on that just because I just did one of these yesterday, and um, it was the second one I've ever done, and like you say, I was baffled by it, and I, one thing I can never remember is what the heck is a non-duplicate hour, and why does this matter, and the other is um, what, like, when I had that conversation with my advisee, what am I supposed to be asking them about? Like, you know, you said, like, well, can you really do it, and so is this just kind of a general 
how are things going? I don't know, like, what's the point of my signature? What am I signing off on? Yeah, so I saw um, I saw a comment that just popped up about the appeals. I'm going to come back to that, that someone had mentioned about 12 hours. But um, no, I mean, the intent of it really is um, that, you know, you are in a program that has 60 credit hours. You know, you have a, you're now doing in a financial aid appeal and you're only 10% of the way through this program. You know, it makes, you know, kind of like, you know, get it together. Are you going, is this going to be, you know, the right fit for you? We're now on appeal number two. You're not even halfway through the program. Let's consider some other options. Um, I am that very open. I am very open to improving this process. So uh, this sort of feedback is, is really helpful. Um, because I mean, like I said, I reach out to the advisors, but I think it's kind of something that's very much in their wheelhouse, but the faculty advisors, it have even less touches. I think, um, just, just my perception, not in a bad way, but just it's, it's not as much as that first year student because the student is a little bit more like on their own at that point, And they're not seeing, you know, the academic advisor, but yeah, just keep sending any ideas you have. Yeah, just from a, a little I don't bit want different it to be a than process of and think it is. Yeah, a little bit different than Nathan. I get them. It seems like I get them. I, I think I've done three in the last week and a half. But and, and what one barrier I think for students is, um, you know, either they've got to make a trip to campus and coordinate a, an appointment time. Um, which is, you know, sometimes can be inconvenient for them, um, or they've got to find some place to scan it in, and then I've got, you know, I get it on the scan thing, and have to convert it and use use Adobe to put it, fill it in, and so forth. That's why I suggest if, if there's some way that we could do it just so it was automated, and if a student could, you know, just say, hey, I, you know, can you, even if we, I don't know, uh, I I'd be happy to help them initiate the form. Um, just so we're not. Yeah, I can. Going back I, I mean, we have, we have a, uh, we have probably forty to fifty dynamic for like electronic um, forms in our office, and to be honest, probably use them more than any other area of the college. So that's not a problem, but it is an issue when it comes to there's multiple components of it, um, and it's just the. It's just the technological side of what makes the most sense when there's four elements of it and the student is submitting one and then they never submit the other three. And then we're sitting there with just files pending forever and they think that that they're done and we have found it. It's sadly just easier to give them a paper packet. Like I said, this is this goes against my nature of literally everything we do. Um, but it's it's the one thing that has remained paper just because they'll send it in and we're, we're, we're spending so many hours and just like man hours processing, chasing them down to say, okay, you submitted these three things, but we still need, you know, your documentation. Um, so yeah, I mean, there could be a dynamic forms or a Google forms with multiple workflows that go to multiple people um, that would, you know, be linked to the uh, student's profile to automatically pull in their advisor. And I mean, we're very well versed as far as doing things electronically. Um, but also, you know, we're cognizant of not overloading OIT in the middle of a new systems integration and kind of holding it, it, as much as we can to before we completely change processes for only them to change in another year or two. But please send me the ideas, even if it is, you know, the simple things like the fillable form and Here's how the conversation should look, and like, we'll do whatever we can. Yes, the fillable PDF. Oh, Nan okay, that was Nancy had a, the other question about uh, a, a student must be 12 hours. It, like I said, unless there's some outside entity requiring it, like their parents' insurance, it, you know, they have to be 12 hours to get coverage, or they're a life scholarship student. No student has to be 12 hours. Sometimes they think I have to take 12 hours so I can get 12 hours worth of aid. Well. It moves incrementally, you know, they're in 12 hours and they have 12 hours of tuition. So the aid moves up proportionally and then it, tuition goes down, aid goes down. So it, they don't realize that. Sometimes they think if I take four classes, they don't realize the tuition's a lot higher too, you know? So 
you can send specific students to us, obviously, and we can review them too if you think that there is a disconnect of what the student actually needs to be doing. Yeah, I um so yeah, I've used the the SAT form that's been online that you can download from the the I guess it's in um, resources for me. But anyway, and I just fill out after I've met with the student, complete my section and forward it on. Um, but I guess the key thing with being a faculty advisor is I know these students and I know where they are in the program a lot better than being able, you know, them having to hunt somebody down and talk with them about what how many courses they have left. Because the majority of the students that I typically process are, you know, within one to two semesters of finishing their degree. And so they're progressing around and along nicely. But I know that's not the case for all of us. Um, I'm going to circle back to the career pathways scholarship. Is that something that you all will mention to the student or, you know, send out a notification that you are in a program that's eligible for CPS? Is that something that I know that I try to inform students about it, but there's still students that seem to not be aware of the career pathways. Um, so I, I myself actually award um, that program currently. I've Well, I have been for the past several years. And so they, I, I review students once a week. Um, within a week of them registering for classes, if they're eligible, our programming automatically picks them up and I award them. So all the information is out on the website and when we award them, I also email them, letting them know they've been awarded because they have to accept their award. Um, the state requires an active certification. So the students are informed uh, when they're awarded. Are you saying students just coming into the college? How do we advertise that yeah, program? I, mean, I have students who um, maybe they've been in the program for a few semesters or so, but they are asking for other scholarship opportunities or, you know, other ways to pay for college. And maybe they're not aware that they're receiving it already. I'm not sure. I'll have to maybe delve in a little bit better on each individual student on if they've actually met the cr criteria. Cause I know GPA is one of those criteria that might hinder some of those from being eligible. So. Yeah. The GPA, you know, they can't be in the arts and science programs. The state doesn't allow that because it's like career industry specific mm -hmm. programs that they're wanting the student to graduate from. But um, it's nothing that the student actually there's no type of financial aid that the student has to say, hey, am I eligible for this? Um, our programming runs kind of behind the scenes, really. Um, and when the students are eligible, it automatically picks them up. So um I mean, but if there's a student that obviously they, they email us all the time, hey, am I eligible? And we review them and let them know why or why not. But at this point, I ran it uh, last Friday after the end of, well, after grades posted. Mm -hmm. And then I ran it again Tuesday. So all students who are registered for the summer um, or this past spring, all students have been awarded. Um, John, you have mentioned that you had three appeals just this week. The your you're typically going to notice an uptick in those appeals after grades have posted and we've ran the evaluations. So that that's probably why you've gotten more. Um, yeah, the appeals. Yeah, I know I've said it like five times, but please send me any suggestions from from your standpoint, even if you think it's minor, any anything that would help. So it's not um, a barrier on your side would be helpful. But, you know, uh, colleges don't have to offer appeals. We not only offer one, but we offer two. We have about 450 students each year who are on an appeal status, um, and we work and work and work with them um, to submit appeals that we know are going to have a very high chance of approval. So we offer that to the student, but it does require some skin in the game, um, and it's not the simplest of things for them to do. Um, I don't think an appeal should be simple, uh, but we'd also don't want it to be painstakingly difficult. But yeah, it does require that the student have a little skin in the game and time spent speaking to their advisor and speaking to academic coaching and being aware of the college's resources um, so they do have a higher chance of success. Very good. All right. Any other questions? Um, sorry. we I know we've really pinned you to the wall on this one, but this is... It's enormously fine. helpful, Amy. And what I'm trying to figure, so I just I just became the department head for English. And so um, our 40X, I think all of our arts and sciences 40X, if I'm not wrong, is tied to advising specifically that we 
need to be our, our, we have to be, we have to be communicating with two advisees each week and we're tracking that and inspire. Now we have been given, um, Hey, for anybody who came in late, just hold off and I will send out the attendance tracking, sorry, the attendance roster thing again, just just bear with me. Okay. Um, for, for those of us who are doing this 40X and we're we're being required to communicate with advisees, we, have, we haven't we have really been given any <clears throat> guidance on like what kind of communi communication we should be doing. Like, what do we say to them basically that, that will actually be yeah. helpful in some way um, and that isn't just sort of generic um, to them. And so as I was listening, you talk about all this stuff and hearing all these problems coming up, I'm thinking, all right, how can we make this actually something that how we make it worth your time. Yeah. yeah. Worth our time and something that will actually help y'all help us and help our students. Um, and so I know that's a big question, but if, if you knew, if you, now that you know that like a bunch of us are required to be contacting two advisees a week, what is the most helpful thing that we can do in that, that for y'all? Um, well, on the faculty side, attendance, proper attendance taking okay. every day is phenomenal. That's just on our side. Okay. Um, for the student, I mean, just being sure that they check their email, that they check their self-service account, um, and that, you know, hey, if you have any financially questions, like, reach out to them. Even if, okay. you know, even if, I mean, we'll, if a student just says, hey, I want to make sure my financial aid is good for this semester, I mean, we do a whole account review with them. Hey, you're enrolled in this many hours. This is your major. Here's the types of aid you can get. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, I would just ha just having them know that they can see everything on self-service, um, okay. that they don't have to be full-time, you know, C's and above, you know, bare minimum, just so you remain in good, and that financial aid isn't never ending. You know, I mean, just very, okay. very high level things. A lot of times they don't know, and they haven't had anyone really to help them with that, but mm -hmm. Yeah. And our email address is super helpful because we have like five to 10 people every day checking it. Okay. That's good to know. I've always wondered, I'm like, well, this, I'm just going to give them this email address and give them a, give them a, a, a physical location to go to. And I'm just going to send them that way. And hopefully it will, I mean, yeah. no, no one ever has come back and said that didn't work. So I, I assumed y'all were, y'all were doing well on your end, but um, that is, it's good to hear um, that. And then um, the other, and this is maybe a little bit more specific, but um, I know, I know we're going to be dealing with it. Um, for those of us who are math, English, um, and then all of us who are advising in arts and sciences who are going to maybe need to answer questions about this, for the co-requisite that students are going to mm -hmm. need to do, um, since that is technically still uh, you know, marked as transitional studies and yeah. life scholarship does not cover transitional studies. Right. Yeah. That's, um, the, it, I guess yeah, that's the, the issue we're strange. anticipating is for life scholarship. Now I know life scholarships always been tricky in that regard anyway, and a bunch of other regards. Um, and so for a lot of us, when we, as soon as we find out a student's on life scholarship, we start getting sweaty and anxious because yes. we so are like, we. oh boy, so oh boy. <laughs> okay. Um, because it's, it feels like the, the rules of that are pretty Byzantine compared to other things. And we're just nervous about steering them wrong. So I we get need it. to send them to y'all. So, yep. um, just though, so we have kind of a, a, a general sense of like how it's going to work. Um, I'm assuming that the best that like the policy moving forward is going to be for students who are on life scholarship. We're going to suggest that they defer that for a semester so that they can use, you know, other forms of financial aid so that they can get that, those co-requisite courses paid for. And then once they've gotten through those, then they can start the clock on the life scholarship. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so when you say the word defer, just to let you know, there's nothing that the student needs to tell us or anyone needs to tell us the programming will pick up. This student doesn't have the requirement, don't award. Um, uh, and okay. then, and then on the back end, our life coordinator um, emails the student, "Hey, you're not you're you have this award on your account or, or on your offer letter. You are not in twelve hours or more. Just a heads up, you're not going to get it." So we also let them know that. Okay. Um, we send out one or two emails. It's also on the cert form that the student signs. Hey, these exact classes and anything in remediation is not covered, and they check and sign it. Okay. So it's, and are they, are they sort of directed places. to, sorry, are they directed to like 
you can't do this, but here's what you can do instead. And here's the process yes. for future that happens. Okay, cool. So what happens is, I mean, we, they, if the student contacts us, I mean, we don't proactively say, Hey, you're not in, you know, remediation, but you're going to get this. And we don't do like an individual breakdown per student in that. Cause it's a, it's a mass email that pulls any student in that group that's meeting these qualifiers, send them this email, letting them know they're not going to get their life scholarship. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it does say you, you can receive other types of financial aid. Um, and it does trigger the students to contact us. But if the student is not enrolled in 12 hours of life eligible courses, you know, they're not, they're not going to get it, but they can be in 15 hours and 12 are life eligible and three are remedial. Okay. Okay. You see what I mean? But I if you're, mean, yeah. yeah, if you're dealing with a student who's in 12 hours and three of those 12 are math, I don't know what the new number is, the 031, the old one, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, it's obviously not going to transmit because mm -hmm. they're in remediation. Uh, and that could vary, their, that could their life still very easily, no, that could still very easily happen simply because for English, the co-rec is one credit hour, for math, the co-rec is two credit hours. And so if a student um, sort of places into a math co-rec and an English co-rec in, in one semester, which is not unlikely. Um, that's three credit hours of yep. technically transitional. So these, this yeah, is I would just sort of what we're aware of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just, and, and like I said, I mean, we do contact the students, but there are always, you know, 50 or so, I don't know, students that are like, still not understanding it even after, you know, all the emails and all the conversations, but yeah, there's nothing they would actively need to do to defer the scholarship. Um, the life start, the life clock starts once the student is in 12 hours or more of life eligible courses. Okay. That's when it starts naturally at the state level. It's not even anything that we control. Okay. That's good. That's good to know. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think there's definitely, it's, a, it's just, a, again, life's a little bit sticky and tricky and always has been. And now with this, it's like, oh boy, how do yep. we, we're already bad at answering questions about life and this got thrown into the, the mix. So how do we move forward on that? So, I mean, it could be too that, you know, as in arts and sciences, something we're the ones who are going to have to, who are going to be encountering that situation the most probably. So that could be part of our 40 X effort in contacting advisees this summer is just like really painstakingly clarifying the situation with that. And and if they have questions about it, make sure that every you know everything's being done properly, you know, to, to go to you before classes start in the fall. Yeah, I mean, even if they're if you have a cohort of students that you, we just need their IDs, I mean, you could send over your forty x list of advisees, and we could see if they're life eligible, and I mean, help you out and just do a little pre sifting paperwork if you're you know data work before. That would be that would be great. Just so you would know, but yeah, yeah, I'll I mean, we don't touch. ever mind. I mean, obviously, send them to us. I think it's always you know best to hear the details from us definitely appreciate any help that you guys can even like mention along the way but um yeah the life is a particular group of students and parents very very fun mm. okay thanks amy yeah any other questions from i have one more this is kind of stuff we've we've had and you mentioned uh, earlier the work study um we've been very fortunate we've had a student for the last two years uh, and it's the first oh, nice. student we've i'm sorry I said, nice. Yeah. And, and she's, uh, and I feel like she's really benefited in a couple of ways. Obviously I think I, she's the financial aid aspect for her, but there's also because of on a pro she's in our program. And I think she's been able to learn um, some substantive things about uh, being a paralegal as part of her duties um, in our department. So are there things, if we identify somebody, I guess, how can we encourage if we identify somebody who we think, might benefit or or, or could uh, could benefit from being in work. So, is there a way that we can help them or direct them? Uh, yeah, uh, on their path. Yes, um, you can send their ID number, their name and ID number, to the financial aid email and say, "Can you please review this student for work study?" And we will. Um, the student can also initiate that process by filling out the work study application that is on our website. It's a, dynam it's a dynamic forms that opens up. They enter their information and submit it with their resume. We get it within a week. Um, they're reviewed and they have to be eligible for financial aid, enrolled in one class that is required for their major. So no courses outside of major. Um, 
and uh, have an unmet financial need. So it's very easy as long as they're in good standing um, and have an unmet financial need. We have a couple hundred thousand in work study that we didn't spend last year. And I mean, that really, we, we could easily hire another 20 to 30 students if, if we had them interested. But yeah, send, send the student's name and ID number and we'll review them. And, and could that even be like once we start into the semester, is it too, or, yeah. or do we need, okay. Great. Yeah, I hire, as long as a student can have um, a two-term commitment, like fall, spring, mm -hmm. I, I really like for them to at least commit to a year, to be honest. I'm not going to hire anyone if they're like, I'm, I'm leaving in three months, you know, because it takes, yeah. it takes a couple of weeks working with HR, unfortunately, because they have to process a background check for them. Um so that can take a, a couple weeks. Um, so, but yeah, just send, send so, them over. And so our students, even that many of our students are career pathways, they're having, but when you say unmet needs, that might be uh, childcare, it may be other things, or is that what? It's the FAFSA calculation. So each student okay. comes in with a, a monetary budget, you know, for the academic year based on how they answer their FAFSA. Mm -hmm. um, and if, let's say a student has a $25,000 12 month budget and of the $25,000 budget, they've been awarded, uh, 8,000 in Pell, 10,000 in loans, and that's it. They would have $7,000 left that we could award them. So as long as they have, as long as their budget budget has not, you know, been met with other types of aid, um, if there's room in their budget, they're eligible, like sufficient right. room, you know, like you would want a student again, that one year commitment. So, I mean, you would want a student to have several thousand dollars of unmet need. Um, and we have tons of those students. Um, they just, and we also need uh, Amy, uh, you just broke up there. We, Hi. Amy, sorry, you're breaking up. We're having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Uh, the last thing we heard was, can we you hear also me now? Need, yeah, we can hear you. Yes. The last thing we heard was we also need, okay. and then. Sorry, I'm no, actually you're okay. Clinton. There's always this weird path to away to Columbia. Um, also need, uh, did I, did you hear what I said about the student, the work? Yeah, I think work study was. And the budget, did you hear me? Budget? Yeah. Okay. Um. I don't remember what I said after that. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm explaining the budget going on and on. They just have to have a um, financial need and able to, you know, work for a few semesters and, you know, we review them. That Those are the basics as far as um, we need position. That's what I was going to say. Um, it, we need empty positions. We're kind of harvesting the amongst faculty and staff. Um, so if you have a need for admin or someone to help, you know, John can probably share what his work study in, in their area does, but, um, you know, they could five hours a week or they could work 25 hours a week. Um, but we, we do need some positions open um, to be able to put students in those spots. If there's any need in your area for a work study student can help with various things. I can work with you on getting a job created. Well, Amy, I, I I really appreciate it. It, it. One last chat. Anybody with any questions before we wrap up? I know we've kept, we've had lots of questions and I'm, I'm very happy, uh, uh, Amy, that you had agreed to come uh, and, and speak with us. Any last, anybody for a question before we let Amy go? Hey, John, if you could email me the, um, the, the slides from today, I know everything's on the website, but it's, it's nice to have everything in one place. And oh, I think people would appreciate yeah. that. So I can include that in the minutes. And by the way, and just so if those of you uh, who hadn't met Amy, but Amy was, was it in March that you were elevated to director of financial aid? Oh, yeah. So Last congratulations. Day of hump day or whatever, uh, leap year. Yeah. Found out. I, 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 I simultaneously congratulated Amy and asked her to speak it by one of our meetings <laughs> so because I knew it was an area of need. So uh, um, I do appreciate, Amy, you coming on and, and presenting. And obviously, you know, hopefully we, we can have uh, perhaps this be uh, maybe 
uh, once a year, we'll have uh, have you back because I know there's always questions as things change and so forth. All right. All right. Well, you're breaking up a little bit, so I, we're going to say thank you, and then uh, we're going to move on on our on our agenda. Um, just next up. Quick thing um, for anybody who came in to the, the Zoom late, I just uh, put the attendance sign in in the chat again. I, I've already removed, um, I think, most of the folks who are rolling off. But so if you're here, if, if not, you can go ahead and just take yourself off there if you want to and just put yourself under the guest column. Or if you came today um, and uh, you don't, you're not seeing your name, go ahead and put your put yourself in there under guest. Sorry. Thank you. So thanks, Amy. As always, kind of our second uh, agenda item uh, each each month is uh, examples of service excellence. Um, is there anyone who would like to recognize somebody for their service excellence? There's got to be somebody from April that was excellent. Anybody? Yep, almost well, been a quiet month. All right, so moving on, um, the president's report. Uh, this week, th this month, we I'm, did. I'm not... sorry, John Bell's. John, sorry, I just thought of something. Uh, someone yep. I'd like to recognize for service excellence. Um, Mary sure. Campbell. Sorry, Mary Campbell, who um, recently came over to to our department from transitional studies, along with some other folks who were delighted to have. Um, she has not only over the last semester. Um, almost single-handedly designed the co-rec that we are going to be using for the English 101 moving forward um, and worked with our redesign team to make that happen, um, which was a huge project for her to do and, and hugely valuable to our department. She also took on, she was also doing that while taking on the new job of being APD for our department, replacing me and handling dual enrollment, which is its own special uh, set of challenges. So uh, she's done all that and man and also served as a sort of a diplomat for the other folks coming over from transitional and helping us bridge, kind of create that bridge um, and merge us together successfully. And honestly, it's just been uh, dazzling to watch her handle all that so gracefully and so effectively. And we're just so delighted to have her on the team. So I wanted to make sure she got recognition for that. Sorry, okay. move on. Any, let's see, uh, anybody else like to recognize somebody? Has it had something in the looking forward to co-requisite reading workshop with Mary Campbell? Okay, all right, very good. Well, next item up, um, uh, we will kind of wrap up. Uh, this will be, um, you know, as we transition year to year, we typically, and, and next month might be a month where we look at, you know, are there committees that we will continue to have um, uh, it, that will will sort of there'll be a uh, they'll they'll continue to act to, to stay active, and there may maybe some that um, uh, have sort of fulfilled their role. Um, so, as kind of one last trip through with our committee reports. Uh, the AI Committee and Academic Misconduct. I know that's been a committee that's had a lot of work to do uh, this past year. And we want to speak to the AI or Academic Misconduct. Uh, that's not usually me, Mimi. Yeah, I think Mimi's gone. I'll say, I think Mimi, I don't think much has happened for the past month, but, um, you well, know. She just texted me to say her screen froze up and she can't do anything and she had to log out and she's trying to get back in. Um, Nathan, yeah, if you want to. I mean, AI is still a hot mess, still a big <laughs> disaster everywhere and there's no end in sight. So um, I think that's the basic news. There's this AI task force committee and uh, it hasn't met yet. It, uh, Dr. Miller sent out a charter for it. So there's no news on that front either. But um, I mean, I think I think Liz and I and others have been talking. I think really the ultimate solutions are going to be at a grassroots level. So we all need to think about how we can revise our classes to prevent this and you know re to rethink our pedagogy. But that's that's all there is. Unless Liz wants to add something to that. 
Um, just the, yeah, I'm trying to think about what I can do as a department head moving forward and at that level and how I can work with other departments to sort of band together to, to be a united um, and consistent. I don't like the word force because I, I guess I'm just kind of tired of, of thinking of this in terms of like a battle to be won or lost because that really kind of puts us at, it kind of pits us against our own students. And that's, that really shouldn't be the vibe moving forward because at the end of the day, we're here to help them. They are here to learn and that is the ultimate objective. And so uh, making it kind of an us against them and arms race against and constantly trying to catch them doing bad things. It's just, I think it's bad for, for everyone um, in a lot of ways. And it's been an extremely frustrating year on that front. And I, I just, that does, that's not to say, okay, we just throw up our hands and say nothing can be done. It's just more of a sense, more of a, more of a reimagining of like, well, why are we doing this? And, and what are we, what do we want to achieve and how, how can we do that in a way that is, that is less a battle and more, yeah, kind of a reimagining of, of what we're here to do. And so that's going to take, yeah, as Nathan says, that's, that's going to take a, a real grassroots effort. Um, it's not going to be, it can't be a top-down effort clearly in that way. And so, um, Part of that could be, you know, this act we we've changed the English department has changed over to an academic integrity contract, which I'm happy to send to anybody who would like it. We're going to kind of test it out over the summer and see what impacts it has, um, because pledge sounds like something you do in the Girl Scouts uh, versus a contract. That's just wording matters, y'all. I mean, it really does. Um, how, what we call things can make all the difference at the end of the day. And we as English teachers, we know that and you all know that as people. So. Um, some of the updates we've made are just sort of more specificity on what is considered acceptable and unacceptable, but also um, sort of what the consequences of violating the contract are um, in, a, in a very clear way so that they can be consistently applied. Um, again, we're the process for doing the referrals to the to the dean's office and on up has been extremely burdensome and um, We've we've been doing what we've been told we need to do, and yet it feels like it's not going anywhere. So because it's it's not going anywhere, <laughs> and they'll be the first to tell us that. I mean, when when we asked Dr. Miller in our most recent you know our most recent meeting with him, you know I I I asked him point blank. I said I said Dr. Miller, you know I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions from my people. I call them my people now because the department head about what to do and how to what you know what the what the process should be for for this. And I don't know what to tell them. So can you can you offer any guidance on on what we should be doing? And he said no. He said no, he cannot. Um, and so that's where we are. <laughs> they, they we have and we have tried that route, and it's just it's not. We're not having the same conversations. We're not our our goals and objectives and our needs are not the same. And that's that's okay. That's fine. So, but we just need to like get together and figure out, well, what are they and what can we do so that we're helping our students rather than just punishing them for, you know, misdeeds. Um, so that's, that's where my head's at on that as a department head moving forward. And uh, I am, we are, we are open to folks coming with their suggestions and their thoughts and their ideas on how to approach that moving forward. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, and I, I know that's going to be an ongoing, and I think we're not alone. Uh, but I think I know that you know the the, the pace at which it's AI is improving and becoming more. Of a, I'm sure it's you know uh, going to continue to be a uh, a challenge. So uh, next, adjunct support. Um, um, John, John, this is Tara. Tara. I wanted, I wanted to add something, something to the AI, AI conversation, conversation in Michelle today. today. Um, um, I wanted, I wanted to, remind to remind everyone there was, there was a really, really good webinar, webinar with, with a panel, panel from, from GTC on the May 1st. Tara, you're, you're echoing. I'm not sure if there's something that you can do because it's, it's kind of hard to hear you. I don't know if there's something you, you could do differently. That usually happens when you've got two Zooms open at the same time. Okay. I don't know if that's what's going on, but. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I, that happens to me every now and then, and I have to leave and rejoin the audio. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to just add something to the AI conversation and Michelle's stead today. 
um, reminding everyone that there was a two hour webinar on May 1st with a panel of presenters from GTC. And our LibGuide now has the recording of that. Um, so lots of lots of work on Michelle's part on how to um, you know, teach students to use citations if they're using AI and that sort of stuff. Um, at least that was ours. Also, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember who presented from the English faculty, but really good information on like what they're doing to address it. And so, yes, Mimi, there we go. I, I thought it might have been Mimi. Um, so I'm placing that URL back in there, but I highly recommend going through there. Again, Larry Miller started off, kicked that off with some of his thoughts. We ended with George. Um, so take a look at that um, and our, our um, LibGuide. And then I will say, you'll notice the URL says chat GPT. Michelle mentioned she's working on renaming that or some sort of redirect so that it encompasses more of just AI and artificial intelligence. Um, you know, it got started and named when chat GPT first hit. So um, let me or her know if you have any questions. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, next to agit support, anything final report for this year? Okay. And then for Azure support, we would have been conversing via email. Uh, I think we have a final deliverable to hand to VP Miller. And I think this is going to be an initiative that uh, the folks are going to run for the next academic year as well. And so mostly the survey was looked to engage with adjunct faculty just to make sure they felt more engaged with the college overall. So that was kind of the idea of the, the survey. And those, those questions have been formulated and we're kind of ready to send those out. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Safety committee, anything new from the safety committee? We don't have anything new, but um, I did try to get in contact with Chief Brooks. I haven't heard back from him, but um, just uh, we recently got an email just to stay vigilant with um, uh, a lot of protesting going on in other college campuses. So just to, to make sure we keep them aware of anything that we as faculty see on our campuses. And I don't know if anybody else, I know that uh, I, I work in the criminal justice building and we've had new doors installed with, uh, they're not, oper I don't think they're operational yet, but with the keypad or the fob passes. So um, those things are coming to fruition. Um, yes, a lot but of cameras have been installed, especially around our building. So um, it's kind of, but uh, I'll, I guess if, if once we, I guess we'll find out when they'll all be functional, but then. The doors are the first major project, I think. Yeah, thank you. Course inclusivity and accessibility. Hey, that's me, sorry. Um, so I've been pretty pretty remiss uh, in getting our group together, but with all the hubbub of changing over to department head, finishing up the semester, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I have actually been in contact with Jill Walker, who is, um, who's actually been helping us uh, with the, the committee without being a member of Senate. Now that she is a member of faculty Senate officially, she's one of our new members. We're very excited about that. Um, I have asked her to kind of carry the mantle forward on, I'll, I'll certainly still pr participate, but um, we need a new spokesperson for that. We also have lost um, several of our members. Um, two, two folks no longer work at the college and uh, one person rolled off, Coleman Ross, of faculty senate um so we are down to just a just a couple of us so for for anybody who is new and looking to join a subcommittee because that is one of the requirements of faculty senate um commitment is to be on a subcommittee we are definitely looking for uh, more folks or anybody who's looking to you know maybe switch over to a switch team so to speak um and i'm going to be sending out we'll we'll talk about the kind of rollover process a little bit more today but one part of that is i'm going to be sending out um the the list that we currently have and um of like who's on which subcommittee and then i'm going to make it editable so that y'all can kind of you know add your name move over whatever it is you want to do so that we get a more accurate list of who's who's on what and yeah as joel just kind of threw in the comments there just a little pitch about um our mission for the accessibility and inclusivity subcommittee um we we know that there are certain minimum requirements that the, our college needs to meet that we all need to meet in terms of accessibility 
to be ADA compliant. And um, that that in itself is a Herculean effort. And the Student Disabilities Resource Center does, I think, a, a pretty fantastic job of, of making sure that um, students are getting the, the, the minimum of what they're entitled to as far as disability accommodations. But as anybody who um, has ever experienced disability knows or who you know, has, has been on that side of it, the minimum is not really, it's not enough a lot of the time um, to be truly successful and to, to really have the same kind of equitable experience as any other student. And so that's what we're here to do is figure out what what are the gaps in in that that we could be working to fill? How can we how can we be working with Dana, the student organization um, that advocates and can acts as a, a group for um, disabled students on campus that that they have missions that they we want to help them achieve and we want to make sure they're included in every conversation because how do you know what people need unless you ask them? And also working with the Student Disability Resource Center to make sure that. Um, those goals are being met and also talking to administration, doing those things too. So if that's something that you also feel passionate about, because it's extremely important um, now more than ever to, to do better than just the bare minimum, then we would love for you to join us in that. And that's all. Yeah, I think this, Liz, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure, but I'm going to, I think that as we've transitioned away from transitional studies, I think this is going to be even a, a bigger issue. Would you, would you agree with that? I would. Well, and I, I think we could probably all agree that just by the nature of where we teach and who we teach, we do um, see a not disproportionate number of students with some form of disability, visible or invisible. But I mean, the statistics are there. Um, we just that's the kind of student population that we serve. And so, yes, that is definitely going to be something to consider moving forward with the, the transitional reform, but also just in general, that's that's who our students are. Their needs are different than than others. And so we need to we need to serve them just just as well as anybody else. And um, our mission is is even greater than it would be at other schools in that regard. So, yeah. All right. Um, remote work, there's nothing new to report for remote work. Concourse syllabus. Any progress on paring down the concourse syllabus? That was Phil that was Phil was on that. Anybody want to report on that? If not, I'll move on. Okay. And then Finally, live for Philip. Yeah, Phil, and, Philip's going to be out today. Oh, you got Lisa. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm here for Philip, so I don't have anything. Okay. And then Lib Guide, last, last uh, committee report. That was Ashlyn Blair, and she is no longer um, a member of the faculty senate. Okay. We'll have to find some. If anybody would like to take up the mantle on that, basically that the that subcommittee's mission was to work with Michelle Rubino from the library to update the faculty senate's libguide page and and make sure that everything was you know needed there. Um, if you're interested in that, taking that up, we definitely need someone or several people to do that um, because it is important. And so um, please reach out to me, and I will put you in contact with Michelle Rubino moving forward. She's a delight to work with. Well, am I still on that committee? I don't know, Stephen. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you're the I guess you're the spokesperson now. Well, we had a big surge of activity there right before Christmas, and then um, it was you know we kept waiting to have another meeting, and we didn't, and now the semester's over. So I guess I'll be the spokesperson for that until we Perfect. reform the okay. committee. All right. Thank you, Stephen. And if anybody right. would like to join and assist Stephen in his noble efforts, we, I, again, I'll send that, uh, that roster out. All right. Um, so not, we've not carried over any old business. So, uh, move on to new business and first want to, uh, introduce our new senators, some of whom are, uh, I guess new to this, upcoming term, but not necessarily entirely new to uh, Faculty Senate. But we've got Jill Walker from Arts and Sciences, uh, Julie McCardle from Arts and Sciences, uh, Tammy Jones from Arts and Sciences, 
um, Robert Ellenberg, um, and Heather Cranach, and I hope I'm not butchering that last name. Um, welcome, all of you. Uh, I think you will um, uh, enjoy your time on Faculty Senate and contribute a lot. I think, uh, again, as, as uh, Liz uh, mentioned, uh, we, we, uh, it, it's a requirement of your participation to serve on a, on a subcommittee. And it's really at those committee levels that we, we get things done. Um, and we, we infl and, you know, part of what we're here for is to influence um, the policies of the college. And I, I think we've been very fortunate in, in getting a seat at the table on a pretty consistent basis um, with most issues, maybe not all issues, but with, with most. Um, we've, we've, whether we've been invited or forced our way uh, to a seat at the table, um, we, we've tried to, to make sure that the faculty's voice is, is heard and, uh, and we're helping improve the, for the college. Um, and so again, welcome to all of you. The, the next step that we have at this time, now that we've elected all the senators, is all of the folks who have been elected as senators would be eligible uh, to now run for a leadership position. Um, there are three leadership positions, uh, president, vice president, and secretary. Um, the president uh, is, I can kind of speak to this from being the president for the last, you, you run the meetings, you uh, develop the agenda, uh, you send out the president's report or draft and send out the president's report each, uh, each month. Uh, the vice president is sort of second in command will run the meetings. Uh, this past year, there were two meetings that I couldn't attend. So uh, uh, Mimi, who in her role as vice president, ran those meetings. Um, and then the secretary, uh, a job I feel like is juggling a lot of things, right, Liz, uh, where you are keeping the minutes um, and uh, you know, updating things on, the, on, on our website, uh, making sure that attendance is taken and so forth. Um, and we have a record of attendance, which become part of the minutes. So um, uh, definitely need somebody in that role. And Liz has served very well this past year in keeping things organized um, and, and recording and so forth. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Did you want to say something else, Liz? <laughs> no, just that it was it was a pleasure. And I, I, I was happy to serve, but I'm happy to also pass that that mantle along to, to someone else if they would like it so that I can just... Yeah. Sit and listen every now and then and focus on my new job as DH. Thanks. So this is in the president's report. And I'll just look. So um, if you would like to serve in a leadership position, um, you can self-nominate and we will, uh, and you should send out, that's part of our thing. You should send your self-nomination to Liz. Uh, that's part, you know, on the president's report, there's information about that. Um, uh, vice president. Each year, we elect a new president, vice president, and secretary. Um, my term, I, the, I am term limited. I guess that I can't run for president again. I am thinking of running for a different position, um, but I'll self nominate. All of you are invited to self nominate. Uh, send your name and the position or positions that you are interested in um, uh, running for uh, to Liz. And we will have that. So we will need that by next Friday, the 17th. And then it will be the following week. We'll go ahead. If we've got multiple people running for the same position, we will have a runoff and have uh, all the senators vote on who will be the um, leadership team. And just to kind of so the leadership team, in addition to attending each of the, uh, of the meetings, also uh, we have, if the leadership team has a meeting with Dr. Miller, uh, I believe it's the second Thursday of each month at one o'clock. Um, and that's sort of our opportunity to, to you know, have a dialogue uh, with him, take our concerns, any, uh, any resolutions been passed and present them to him. Uh, he provides us for, with, with information to share with Senate. Um, so that's the, those are a couple, obviously the meeting that, that, um, um, leadership meeting as well, our, our time commitments, other than in addition to the other you know, serving on committees and, and the other things you might do. 
So any questions about um, and then about the, uh, the leadership election process? Okay. Any other new business that anybody would like to uh, bring up in our in this our transitional meeting for May? All right. Well, hearing none, I am going to uh, adjourn the May meeting again. Thank you for those senators who are rolling off. Um, we certainly do appreciate your service. Um, I will personally uh, extend my thank you to Liz and Mimi um, as, as being great support as part of the, the leadership team. Um, I think we're very proud of what we've been able to accomplish over the last couple of years. Um, and and we, uh, we're hopeful that we'll just keep the ball, we'll keep the ball rolling. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, with that, we'll gavel to a close. And we'll see you for our meeting in June, the first uh, Friday in June. I believe it's June 7th. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. You can go ahead and go, Tammy. We're done. This is how I catch the people who just turned the Zoom on and didn't actually hang around for the meeting. <laughs> That's hilarious. I was just typing my uh, email to you and John. Get it. Mark, Frank, and Terrence. Bye, I guess. <laughs> Have a great weekend. See you at bye, the next Liz. one. <laughs> bye, Tammy. <laughs>